Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are in this world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, Managing Editor of DevOps.com and moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. Before we get started with a, a what promises to be an absolutely fabulous webinar today, we have a few housekeeping items we do need to go over first. First, uh, today's webinar is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, know that you'll be receiving an email with a link to the webinar on demand post event. Also, we are taking questions from the audience during this webinar, so if you have a question at any time for either of our speakers today, uh, please use the control panel and submit your question, and then we'll take about 15 minutes or so near the end of the presentation and go through the audience questions. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and dive right on into today's webinar, which is Avoiding the DevOps Tax. Our speakers today are Mark Punsack, who's the head of product at GitLab, and Christopher Kondo, who is senior analyst at Forrester. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining me today. Thank, Thank you, Sean. Great. Uh, Mark, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you and let you do your thing. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. So today's big topic is avoiding the DevOps tax. But to get there, we're going to start more generally with digital transformation and current trends in DevOps, and then lead up to the DevOps tax. And finally, we'll close with some best practices. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to hand this off to our guest speaker, Chris Kondo from Forrester to start. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, and thanks everyone for having me here today. So one of the things that you know we hear about a lot at Forrester and we study and you hear it in the industry is this whole idea of digital transformation and the idea that digital transformation is you know causing companies to do all these various you know automation or DevOps or whatever. And so the whole idea is like you know what you know what is digital transformation? What does it really mean? And so, you know, one of the things that you can look at even from this slide is the idea that, you know, digital transformation is all about moving ahead quicker with not only just, you know, delivering software faster, but delivering value faster. So when we think about digital transformation, we think about and talk about delivering value to your customer quickly, repeatedly, and with high quality. Next slide, please. So, one of the things that um, uh, you know we, that I like to talk about is the whole idea of customer obsession and com customer obsessed DNA. If you want to actually execute on a digital transformation initiative, you need to keep the customer in mind, and that means you know going from customer aware, like I know we have customers, I know they come into my store, or I know they use my website, or I know they want to interact with um, you know our application, to being customer led allowing the customer to sort of guide your product planning, guide your strategy. And that means staying connected with the customer so you know exactly what's going on, how they're using your product, taking the uh, information that they're giving to you and putting it directly to use in your product. The next one is being data rich. How many times do you have this situation where you've got loads of log files, loads of information, but you're really not doing much with it? So, we're, so you gotta move from being data rich to insights driven. You gotta go from being perfect, which is, you know, I don't want any bugs, I want 100% code coverage, to being fast. But we find out time and time again that trying to be perfect just doesn't work. No one ever releases code that's 100% bug free. So don't try to make that your mantra. Try to do something that you can get the, out the door fast and recover fast and repeat that process. And then finally, go from being a siloed organization or a siloed team to being connected, being connected with your customer, being interconnected within your team and with your organization. <laughs> Next slide. So one of the biggest uh, factors that's really changed over the last few years is this whole idea of, you know, and, and putting the customer first kind of came about with what I would say is like the kind of the mobile experience and the whole customer experience. It really kind of changed the game. And so when we think about the customer experience, we think about the complete end-to-end -end user experience the customer has with your product. We're not just talking about, you know, 
you know, do they go onto the website and, and, and buy something from you or do they have an IOT bracelet that maybe somehow they walk into your store now and they're completely connected with you? Uh, is it your automobile that you not only sit down and hold onto the steering wheel, but it connects to your cell phone and, uh, you know, connects the user more intimately with that experience? And so customer experience is much richer than it used to be. Customer experience is really a complete end-to-end -end experience the customer has with your product. Next. And so here's, a, here's kind of an example of what I mean by digital transformation impacting the customer experience. Uh, let's say like, you know, you wanna do your taxes. You go to the tax site and you download your you know, 1040 form or whatever form it is. You gotta fill it out. You gotta drop it in the mailbox. And then you kind of like you kind of have to wait. You don't really know what's going to happen. So from the business perspective, this is perfectly optimized. You know the forms are available. The, you know what's the big deal, right? The the person doesn't have to go to the post office anymore. They can just go to the website and download a form. The problem is that the customer experience really hasn't changed. It hasn't changed at all. It's an afterthought. You don't know how, if if that customer is enjoying this experience. You don't know how long it took them to fill out the form. And then most of all, the customer doesn't even know if they filled the form out correctly. And so they have to wait, they have to hang around and wonder, uh, you know, is my tax return gonna come back? Did I do something wrong? And so, you know, that whole, the whole uh, sort of like direction of delivering value is in the wrong direction. The value here is that the, the business made their life easier, but the customer's life still stinks. So what we wanna do is we wanna change that around. And this next slide kind of helps you out and understand what I'm talking about. We want to go from, you know, a digitally transformed experience where the user just says, you know, and this is borrowed from TurboTax, obviously, not trying to, you know, trying to, trying to give them any uh, here, but, but, you know, this is a really, this is the main idea, right? Take a picture of your W-2, it automatically validates the form, automatically uploads that to uh, the, the tax site, and then if, if everything goes okay, they even, they even put the money right in your bank for you. So the customer you know, gets an instantaneous response. They get a great reaction from filling out the form. They know if it's right or wrong. They have options, they have help along the way. They're not just fumbling around trying to figure out if they're doing the thing right. Where's my number two pencil, et cetera. It's all done, it's all nice and tidy. They get their bank and they move on. So the, in this case, the user's experience is optimized via direct connection to backend capability and processes. Previously, those backend capability and processes were the realm of the business, and the business managed that by exposing those and opening up that processing capability to the front end and integrating the customer into that experience, you've created a complete end-to-end -end experience that's optimized for the customer and delivers an excellent customer experience. So that's what we mean by digital transformation, and this is why it's so important. And to further that point, let me show you what we're, we're seeing in the industry as far as how customer experience actually impacts a company's performance. Next slide, please. So in this particular case, Forrester actually did research where we discovered that the leaders who excelled at the Forrester Customer Experience Index, and Forrester has this index for measuring your customer experience, the goodness of it versus the badness of it. Those customer experience leaders outperform the customer experience laggards by on average of 29 points in the stock market. That is absolutely remarkable. So that means that these people who are, have, you know, and we did this in a, in a, as a portfolio perspective. Now we're not trying to say that there's a causality here, but there's definitely a correlation here. The people with the bad customer experience, their stock is lagging those companies that have an excellent customer experience. So that's showing you that customer experience really matters. Uh, it really does make an impact on the bottom line. And digital transformation is a real force to be reckoned with. Next slide. So, you know, what else is going on? Let's talk about, for example, rideshare and self-driving cars. Now, everyone is using those these days, or most people are anyways. But you might think, all right, what's the big deal? Well, take a look at the industry that thought it wasn't going to be uh, it, that thought it might be impervious to that, the taxi industry. There's an industry that had uh, heavy government regulation. It had a very high uh, price of entry. You had to buy a medallion like that sometimes cost thousands of dollars to be a, a taxi cab driver. You had to be certified. You had to go through all kinds of regulations and have you know a certain kind of car. 
These folks thought that they were buying into a, a regulated system that was going to be protecting them and their business investment. It didn't turn out that way. It turned out that Uber and Lyft and other ride sharing guys just entered their market and didn't care about those regulations. And it turns out the government's turned sort of a blind eye to it and doesn't care. They think it's actually healthy. And what does that leave? That leaves this industry completely decimated. And there's already been, you know, some very interesting and sad articles about people that have taken extreme measures to kind of bring that to light. Take a look at healthcare. Healthcare administration, just the fact that Amazon talked about the idea of bringing their own healthcare plan to market caused all the other or, or major healthcare indexes to drop. Think about the fact that you don't have to go to your doctor anymore to get a, um, a flu shot. You can go to CVS. You're going to see more and more disruption like that, and that's going to put pressure on not just large healthcare industries. It's going to put pressure on your mom and pop and your regular doctor's office because they count on people coming in the door, not only getting a shot, but maybe getting something else done while they're there, maybe a blood check or who knows what. I mean, it might be good health practice to see your doctor once in a while when you do this, but the fact of the remaining the fact remains, those are revenue streams for these small businesses, and they're going to be disrupted in ways that maybe they don't they don't expect right now. How about Amazon entering the grocery business? You think like that seems like a reverse brick and mortar kind of move. But now all the other grocery stores are thinking like, do we have to digitize? Do we have to make our stores more amenable to digital uh, experiences? Should people be able to just go around the store and throw stuff in a shopping basket, check it off with their cell phone and walk out the door? That's causing a great disruption. It's also causing disruption as far as supply chain management and other types of things that go on in the background that Amazon excels at. So expect more disruption there. And the whole fact of the matter is, you know, it's like, who's next? The common thread is placing the customer first. If there's a place where the customer is not being placed first and some company can come along with an innovative way to do it, it seems like the, the government is, is open to it and customers are certainly open to it as well. So the bottom line is really no business is impervious to this type of uh, uh, disruption of, 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 of their business. So how do you, how do you, you know, manage that? How do you wrangle that digital disruption? How do you, you take that, that energy that's being placed there and bring it all into your software development team? Well, we, talk, we call this you know, modern application delivery. The whole idea of taking the, those, those four tenets we mentioned earlier, being customer-led, insights-driven, fast, and connected, and tying them to your modern application delivery of technology, structure, culture, talent, metrics, and processes. You need to take those things into consideration and build your software development process around that. So let's see how we can um, maybe elaborate on this and think about the ways you can, you can put these things into place. So the very first thing that I always tell people, and it turns out every time I go and do an advisory with a client, uh, it's always about understanding what we mean by this concept of agile plus DevOps. I, I never talk about just agile alone, and I never talk about DevOps alone. I think these two things are needed together to really make uh, the team hum and operate at top efficiency. And we're talking about the idea of having people, people organized in team models, so the organization structure supports these product teams managing their own uh, individual components. We talk about platforms, the idea of having like a, you know, a DevOps platform, not just a collection of tools, but a platform that can be instantiated and repeated over and over again. You don't want people hand crafting all their tool chains all the time. You don't want a situation where every time uh, an engineer changes teams, he has to learn a whole new set of tools. You want there to be platforms that can support these uh, engineers so that like, you know, if they go from one team to another, uh, they can expect a similar experience. But you also need to encourage, you know, innovation within that as well. And also the process, agile and lean, continuous delivery, integrated governance, integrated compliance, integrated security. You need to take all these components and integrate them into these uh, pieces of your software delivery process. So let's, let's take a look at the next step. So one way to understand uh, your process is to do what's called a value stream mapping uh, exercise. And what's really exciting is this comes from the Lean Manufacturing uh, Manifesto. There's been, there's been books written about you know, lean software development. And what's really interesting is we're now seeing trends where uh, vendors are starting to offer value stream management tools to capture these types of metrics. It turns out that many connected tool chains have these metrics and you can actually capture them and understand these things anyways. But the whole idea of it is actually understand all the steps in the software delivery process. 
this is what's known as the value stream. It's like, how do you get an idea from the very beginning from your business team? How does it go through all the various locks and gates out the door to production? And you take a look at all those steps, whether it be, you know, you have to wait for approval, whether it be the code needs to be checked in and be uh, code reviewed, whether it needs to be tested or signed off by QA or signed off by compliance or governance or whatever the various steps are. A lot of times, just looking at the tool chain might not be enough. Oh, I check code in, it goes through continuous integration, then it goes testing, and then it goes onto a server. Well, what are the things that happened before and after that? How did that uh, work item get approved? How did that epic and story get developed? All those things need to be understood because you want to be able to automate all of those things from end to end. And you want to shrink out all the wait time so that all you're doing is process time. You want to get it as optimized as possible. Doing a value stream exercise, understanding your full CI CD pipeline is the first step. The next step that you want to take is think about integrating product teams. So we talked about this uh, a couple slides earlier. The whole idea is that you want an integrated product team. And these folks, you know, they're all we're showing all different colors here, but the reality is that they need to, they can be one team that encompasses a lot of different skill sets. They need to be sort of deep. So you don't want to be in a situation where I was just at a client the other day where their, their concept of agile was they develop a bunch of code, then they hand it off to a security expert. And that security expert lets it sit on his desk for three weeks, decides what he's gonna do with it, and then hands it back to them. And then they think about, all right, now we gotta do a few more steps and they hand it off to a compliance expert. She takes a look at it after a couple of weeks and then she decides, you know, how do I decide if this is compliant? Maybe I do a few things and then she sends it back to them. That is just like the, the, the sort of like, <laughs> pardon my French ass backwards way of doing things. What you really wanna do is you wanna do things where the team owns the responsibility for security. The team owns the responsibility for compliance. They have these other um, uh, entities around them that can advise them on how to do best practices. They wanna be able to check in with a security expert and say, here's our design, here's our architecture, here's how we're handling these problems. What are we missing? What do we need to be doing next? And so all of those teams sort of act as shared resources. They don't act as you know, blockers on a particular project. The, the product team really should own its metrics. It should own the, the, the capability to bring that product from idea all the way to production. And along the way, they have these other entities that help them and sort of like you know, share in the whole responsibility of bringing the product through the door. But in the end, it's the product team that kind of owns that. Next. And so one way that you can enable these product teams, and this has really been a really big enabler, is the whole idea of adopting a modern application architecture which incorporates microservices and incorporates containers. There's nothing that's been more revolutionary in my mind than the whole idea of moving to a microservice architecture. It kind of all hit home when I was at a DevOps meetup a few years ago. I used to think that microservice architecture was just gonna be really chatty, really uh, filled with latency and issues. Uh, such as managing APIs and whatnot. And when I sat down and listened to this retail company talk about how they actually broke through their problem with managing a giant monolith and how their whole team couldn't release a simple bug because they had to wait for the whole thing to be deployed and the whole thing to have to go through the big giant pipeline. It was just a big fat monolith trying to go through this pipeline. It said it took forever. They started just breaking off chunks of it and loosely coupling it using APIs. And now, you know, their search engine on their retail site and their type ahead functionality on their retail site and their, you know, what's happening now on their retail site and what's on what's on sale today. All of those components can all be managed, released independently of each other, and they can all work loosely together. And so the microservice piece wasn't about just making things small. It was actually about helping teams work independently from each other. So you could release components, you could release architecture as the business needed rather than as the slowest link in the chain required. And containers are another thing that are really revolutionary. It really helps drive home that separation of concerns between the developer's realm and the operations realm. You know, DevOps was kind of messy. People had thing, their fingers in each other's business, sort of like, but containers sort of helps define that. It sort of helps the ops people and the people that worry about operational efficiency understand like, hey, I know my realm. I know where I need to automate. I know how to do the SRE practices and automate how containers get delivered and how systems of uh, of operation get managed. And the developer can say, great, I understand my realm. I understand how all of these things are gonna fit into the container. I worry about how do I automate my development process. And it kind of makes 
It allows folks to worry about what they're best at rather than trying to have everybody you know, know everything. Next. And so what we talk about, you know, you know, all of these things, they all work best when there's a complete and integrated DevOps pipeline. And we're talking about from the backlog and the ideas all the way through, you know, CI, CD, testing, configuration, management, deployment, capturing metrics, capturing KPIs, and just doing this in a circle rather than a straight line because you want to always take what you just did, learn from it, take the metrics, take the KPIs, and, and decide how can we do better? How can we innovate? What new tool do we need? What new process do we need? What can we eliminate from this? What should we automate? What should we you know, no longer be doing anymore because it's redundant? Those are the types of things you learn from a continuous and integrated tool chain that you can't learn from a disjoint tool chain or a non-automated tool chain. Next. So these are some of the trends that I, that I see happening. Uh, I just ran a wave on continuous integration tools and customers told us loud and clear that they are looking for a complete integrated tool chain because they're tired of integrating their own tool chain. It's, it's great to have the integrated tool chain, but uh, it comes uh, at a cost. And it comes at, you know, basically what I've been hearing about a 10% of their engineering team is spent maintaining these DevOps tools and they're trying to find a way to shrink that. Uh, you know, application development delivery professionals are looking for integrated solutions or SaaS solutions to simplify tool chain management. The idea of managing all these servers on your own is, is it's complex. You know, you know, there's so many servers running under people's desks that, you know, just chewing up compute time. You know, if you could have a self-provisioning system or a SaaS-based system where the developer just can instantiate it or the test team can instantiate it, much better than having to request an IT team to, um, to provision something for you. We're also seeing DevOps vendors, <laughs> sorry, I haven't, I've gotten, I'm going a little bit too slow, I guess. Uh, DevOps vendors are consolidating and providing complete tool chains out of the box. And the ability to model, integrate, and manage and monitor DevOps tool chains end to end is also a growing requirement. So in, across the industry, these are the trends we're seeing as DevOps adoption is growing. Next. Uh, and what we're seeing is, you know, it kind of varies. Uh, public sector and healthcare are the slowest ones to adopt. Uh, utilities and financial services seem to be the quickest ones to adopt. And kind of in the middle is the retail and wholesale. But not too surprising, right? Places where there's a lot of governance can make you go slower. Places where there's less governance allows you to go a little bit quicker. Next. And so uh, the bottom line is, you know, building and maintaining a DevOps tool chain is complicated. It's a lot of moving parts. Uh, and so anything that you can do to kind of simplify that and make it easier on your team to manage it is usually a good thing because having a, a complete and integrated DevOps tool chain is part of your, needs to be part of your digital transformation strategy. Uh, and so, again, back to my 10% uh, uh, of effort, these are all the sort of integration points that come about from having to you know, integrate. If you think about it, every single tool in your tool chain can, can create like a friction for your team to manage that. So anything you can do to minimize that 10% tax on maintaining your tool chain is usually a good thing. Give time back to your engineers. And so, uh, and, and so interestingly enough, that tax and that, and, that, and that complexity sort of uh, ends up translating into this sort of overestimation of DevOps maturity by executives. Uh, we went out and surveyed executives and what we found out is that, you know, usually by about 10 or 15 percentage points difference, uh, executives in, C in the C-suite thought they were doing all the right things to automate and implement DevOps. But by and large, when we talked to the practitioners, it was about 15 percentage points less that were actually doing it. And the reason is that this complexity of implementation is not accounted for. And the complexity of sort of adoption is not accounted for because doing DevOps isn't easy. It's, it's harder than people think. What's great about this slide is uh, we just launched our, uh, the results of our DevOps survey. Well, it wasn't a DevOps developer survey, but there was also this huge discrepancy between what the managers thought and what the developers um, you know, said they were actually doing. Yeah. It's really interesting, interesting industry trend. <laughs> yes. And it's good to uncover these kinds of differences because it can help you feel, realize, you know, when you're talking to these different uh, folks at these, uh, in, in these, companies and a lot of times you know when we're when we're when we're evangelizing or selling you know you're talking to different personas you're talking to the implementation persona who's usually the loudest you know voice in the room and then you're talking to the actual buyer who needs to kind of be educated and they both sometimes aren't talking to each other and 
you know, it takes folks like us to actually get them to talk to each other and understand that there's a gap. And so again, here's another, uh, you know, interesting, uh, nice graphic. You know, 66% of developers expect at least some teams to use DevOps by the end of 2017. So, you know, everyone is expecting this trend to come. Um, and six, but, you know, 64% of development shops integrate, you know, dev and ops staff on at least some teams, but only 38%, you know, cite an excellent working relationship with ops. So even though everyone says we're gonna do DevOps, and you know we we have to have some integration they're saying there's still you know some rough spots between them and so i mean the other interesting one is on process and tools here 23 percent of development teams are automating builds um but 20 only 27 percent you know are doing continuous integration and 39 percent of developers use open source and release management tools and so i mean it seems like you know there's so much buzz in the air about like you know that two thirds of the world wants to be using DevOps, but the reality is that like, it's only about 25% that are actually implementing it or implementing it in an effective way that they feel that they're actually getting something done. So there's still a lot more work to be done and a lot more uh, help needed to help increase adoption and make it work a little bit more efficiently. Yeah, and we saw that same thing on our survey as well. It looked like you know something like 60 or more percent of people wanted DevOps, but only 23 people, 23% self-reported that they were actually doing DevOps. Right, Who right. wants it, but there's this lag. Yep, exactly. So I guess that actually wraps it up. Uh, these are now my slides, uh, so I'll take them over. Thank you, Chris, that was fantastic. Um, really helpful stuff. Um, Thank you, Mark. Remind me too, the, the very first slide you had there, um, you know, it's a subtle thing, but you said delivering value faster. Because as an industry, we do kind of get caught up in delivering code faster. And it's uh, really good to re be reminded that you know code doesn't matter, value does, and it's all about what you deliver to your customers, um, you know, that, that they actually find valuable, um, and that is what we're all trying to optimize for. It's not about lines of code; it's value. But uh, anyway, so by now it's pretty obvious that business uh, businesses depend on the speed of their DevOps lifecycle. Uh, but despite spending billions on DevOps software last year, you know, there's tons of wasted time. And a lot of organizations are disappointed with the results. Sure, DevOps has improved things and we're better off than before. But the true promise of DevOps hasn't been fully realized yet, at least for most of us. And the DevOps tools have brought improvements to lifecycle speed, but the tool chain itself limits how fast we can go. And this is another example of what Chris was talking about. This is a typical DevOps tool chain. Tons of different tools tied together to deliver DevOps. And you've got different tools for planning and code creation and CI and security testing and packaging and release and deploy and configuration management and monitoring. I mean, that's a lot to, to cover there. But the integration complexity, you know, administrating all of these products and connecting them together, it's not like you just snap them together in a sequence the interactions are actually complex with multiple connections for each component. You know, for example, your CI needs to talk to version control, but also your code review and your security testing and your container registry and your configuration management. And the permutations are staggering. Uh, it's not just a one-time configuration either. It's not like some administrator does this and you're good to go for the rest of the year. Each new project needs to reconnect all of these pieces together. And that has you know, this huge this burden on the developer and the development teams. So the time spent on integrating and maintaining these complicated tool chains is costing DevOps teams. Which brings us to the DevOps tax. You know, that little bit, um, you know, Chris mentioned the 10%, that gets skimmed off the top and it limits your efficiency. But while it might seem small, you know, 10%, right? Hey, it's just 10% wasted. But like any tax, the real impact is on how it changes behaviors. So when it's a pain to integrate security, how many teams just don't bother? Or when it's a pain to share information between teams, how many organizations overcome that burden and find a way to work together? How much impact does this tax have on collaboration? With separate tools and separate processes, we're naturally encouraging separate silos where functional teams work in isolation. And as Chris mentioned, one of the key things here, you know, vertically integrated product team needs to work really tightly together, but if the tooling gets in the way, that's a real problem. So is it possible to live with that tax and still achieve true DevOps? 
Sure, it is. But the tax makes it harder than it needs to be. Now, the sequential DevOps toolchain tends to be opaque, inefficient, and uncontrolled. But what does that mean? Well, the different silos between teams and their tools make it hard to understand the whole instead of the individual pieces of the puzzle. It's really hard to gain an overall visibility of the problems that need to be solved. Individual silos also mean that teams still rely on manual or semi-automated handoffs. And even if they're fully automated, one team can't start their work until the previous team finishes their work. You know, with the, Chris talked about handing it off to the security people and then they've got to schedule it and it just sits on the desk for three weeks before they even pick it up. That kind of, you know, even if that's automated, it doesn't matter if the next team doesn't pick it up for a long time. And also, you know, different permissions and security policies across the team leads to an uncontrolled environment where it's difficult to establish trust. Now, to, to put this in context in a different way, there are a few stages companies typically evolve through on their DevOps journey. On the one extreme, there's nothing but source code management and everything is manual. And then you add CI, and then you add CD, and then you get your first DevOps tool chain, but it might still be disjoint and disconnected, you know, a bunch of pieces hobbled together. But then you get an integrated DevOps tool chain and that feels better. But as we just showed, it still has its problems. The DevOps tax is still there. So the next step is a unified tool chain. And here, usually it's the, the pieces that come from the same vendor with all the same look and feel, and they're easier to integrate together, or maybe even a couple of them are prepackaged together, but it's still not quite seamless. So what we need to get to is concurrent DevOps. Because the entire DevOps lifecycle, when the entire DevOps lifecycle is seamless, magic starts to happen. Teams can work concurrently, not sequentially. Silos are broken down and teams can work together at the same time seamlessly collaborating. They're empowered to act without waiting for permission, but with full accountability and with security embedded in the process, not just an afterthought. So put it another way, when continuous integration testing, code quality, performance testing, and security testing are all baked in from the very first push, developers can deploy with confidence. And when you're, sh when you're shipping continuously, your changes are smaller, so any mistakes are smaller. And when everything is visible, problems are caught sooner and more people can help fix them. And when deployments are easy and continuous, errors recover faster. All of this comes together to turn that 10% efficiency improvement into a three times faster DevOps lifecycle for software development teams. But when I say teams, I'm not just talking about dev and ops because the DevOps lifecycle depends on getting input from teams outside of development and operations. The more efficiently dev and ops and security and business people can communicate and collaborate with each other, the faster they can deliver value to the customer. With concurrent DevOps, each group gets an experience tailored to their needs, but shares the same data and interface as everyone else. So collaboration is easy. Imagine an ops person finds an issue in production and they drill down to find the problem and see that a recent deploy caused the problem. Or simultaneously, a dev gets alerted that their recent deploy triggered a problem in production, goes to the code and sees a performance change right there where they're looking. When dev, ops, biz, and security talk, they're looking at the same data, but from their own point of view. Now, of course, GitLab offers con uh, concurrent DevOps with a single application for the complete DevOps lifecycle with visibility of all projects and relevant activities. And teams can see everything that matters, you know, changes, status, cycle time, security, and operational health are instantly available from a trusted single source of data. Information is shown where it matters most. For example, the production impact is shown together with the code that caused that change. And developers see all relevant security and ops information for any change. With GitLab, there's never any need to wait on synchronizing your monitoring app to version control or copying information from tool to tool. GitLab frees teams to manage projects, not tools. These powerful capabilities eliminate guesswork and help drive accountability and give everyone the data-driven confidence to act with new certainty. So bringing it all together, here's a recap of some of the best practices. We heard from Chris that to maximize your digital transformation, you need to optimize your CI CD pipeline, create integrated product teams, and modernize your application 
architecture with microservices and a cloud native approach. But the tool chain still has DevOps tax. So to help avoid that, reduce the number of uh, integration points, integrate as deeply as you can, and strive for a single conversation across development, operations, security, and business. And as a final parting tip, if you're just getting started, start with continuous integration. Automating tests and building confidence in your code will pay dividends many times over. If you already got CI, then move on to continuous delivery. Automate deployments and make them less scary. If you've already started the DevOps transformation, then embrace the culture. You can only go so far when there's a wall between Dev and Ops. And with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Awesome, awesome. Wow, I have learned so much so far, and I'm sure the audience has as well. There have been a number of questions that have come in already, but uh, if you do have a question for Chris or Mark, please uh, use that control panel. Go ahead and get your question in. Uh, we should have uh, plenty of time for questions here. And with that, I'm actually going to get going on those questions. OK, um, first question, DevOps has been traditionally about dev. Any perspectives, surveys, or examples on the ops, the ops part of DevOps, like production automation, continuous monitoring, environment provisioning, things like that? That's a great question. Um, I think you know a lot of DevOps did spawn from you know sort of the you know the development side of things and so you know developers want to you know deploy to production that's sort of the first thing and you think oh i'm deploying to production so i must be doing devops right because uh, whatever i it, it went into operations but if you stop at the deploy that's not really covering you know operations at all um you know, because there's there's more to just the you know running things in production. There's the performance of the thing in production, the security, the um, scalability, uh, you know, the cost. You know, there's so many things that factor in. And um, and again, if you just stop at hey, I deployed, so I'm doing DevOps. That's not really it. So you know, being able to bring back monitoring, being able to say hey, this change um, you know caused uh, you know more you know whatever more memory to be consumed or you know, there's a higher error rate or any of these kinds of things, um, you know, that's, that's really important to bring into that. Um, getting also on that is not just like, if you're, if you're still sort of doing all your development, thinking you're agile, thinking you're really great, you're deploying to production, but then you throw it off to an ops team to own afterwards. And if they get paged afterwards, that's, that's really only going so far with DevOps. Um, you know, magic thing happens when the developer that deploys is actually responsible for the thing running in production, when they get paged, when you don't have dev and ops, you know, and handing things back and forth, but you've got just one team that's together, you know, in support of that, that thing. And that's a, that's, a, that's a really magical thing when that happens. Chris, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, so, uh, you know, my experience um, was basically that Exactly that. So, you know, you write the code, you own the code, uh, you know, and the interesting thing is that when we when we switch to a DevOps mode at, at my former company, um, we, um, you know, thought we were going to do it all. And then we realized and we started talking to these operational folks that there was a lot more to it that we hadn't thought about, like, you know, how are you going to geo distribute static images? Are you going to use a CDN? How are you measuring latency? Are you worried about, you know, different types of configurations? And so it turned out that, you know, the developers didn't know everything we thought we knew. <laughs> and yeah. um, we could certainly learn a lot from our operational uh, friends. And, you know, they were working hard to, um, to standardize on automation platforms. But, uh, you know, at the time I was working in the industry like four, four or five years ago, there weren't always a lot of tools available to do that. The, we didn't have, you know, standard container, standard standardized containers and Kubernetes and things like that. You know, th these guys were basically dealing with virtual machines and configurations and so forth. And so um, the idea that, you know, you know, the developer can own everything, they really should own everything about the, the application. The application needs to perform on the system. They need to collaborate with the operations engineer to find out what are the parameters of that system, what's the best way to optimize it for that system, and have it be like a collaborative approach. And then when something goes wrong, the operations team's job is really to make sure that the information that the developer needs to debug that, investigate, is made available to them in a timely manner. So that means about providing tools that allow you to investigate you know, log files or other types of issues or cat capture metrics 
that can tell you before the site goes down that something bad's happening. And so, yeah, when when developers own code and when developers are on pager duty, that you know, that's when things get a little bit more automated, and they really start understanding that um, their software runs uh, in an environment, and that environment needs to be understood by experts who understand how that environment should be optimized. And so, yeah, there is a lot to the op side of it. I think the other interesting thing that's happened is Google published that book or about SRE, and I think that's having kind of an interesting uptick. And folks are asking us a lot, at least at Forrester, a lot of questions about how does that apply to me? You know, I have a legacy business. Should I be thinking about this? And so it's actually been a great conversation starter. Whether you can adopt all those principles or not, it's very interesting, very intriguing about how operations uh, individuals can think of themselves as developers as well. So it's, I think it's like about a mindset. It's very interesting. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, this one is for you, Mark. How is concurrent DevOps different from DevOps plus Agile? Good question. So um, I think concurrent DevOps is really about sort of the, you know, the depth of the integration and you know, it's a lot to do with the tools, but then it's a lot to do with what the tools enable. And so it's about making sure that your, your teams work really collaboratively and have a conversation and, um, and you know, can work seamlessly as a team. And again, you can, you can technically do that with a hard tool chain, but it's easier if you've got tooling that, to go with it. So when those things come together, when you've got the tooling that enables it and the culture that enable everybody to work together, that's when you really can see this concurrency where people are working in parallel together collaboratively. And, um, and I think that that's really what that's about. Now, you know, you have to, probably start from you know agile and there's you know there's agile with a capital a and agile with a little a you know um <laughs> you don't have to actually do agile practices to be agile you know the adjective um and i think uh in, in a lot of ways you know lean startup is the other kind of uh, methodology that's out there um the point is you need to move fast you need to be reactive but you also need to work collaboratively together and that's where the concurrent devops really kicks in okay Great. Um, still time to get your question in. If you have a question for Mark or for Chris, please go ahead and use that control panel. Um, go ahead and uh, do that. We have still have about uh, 15 minutes or so, but we have a lot of questions. So next one, can you provide an example of what deep integration means? I think this is for you, Mark. Yeah, um, it's a little hard to, to visualize with just words, um, but uh, like one of the, one of the, the things I like to talk about most is the uh, the developer who, who goes and pushes up a, a merge request in GitLab parlance or pull request if you prefer. You know, some chunk of code that they're that they're requesting to be changed, and people are reviewing it. And um, and normally, traditionally, you just look at the code, and then um, you know somebody reviews it. Maybe at most they check it out locally and run it and test it and see if it works. But otherwise, you know, they just say, yeah, that looks good. And you, you merge it in the master. And then mm -hmm. at some point later, it gets to deployed to production. Then you actually see it live. But that's really kind of the end of the story until some ops person comes back and starts screaming and says, hey, something went wrong. So a deeper integration would be, uh, you know, you create this merge request and we'll create a review app immediately. And so you don't have to pull it locally to see what you're doing. You can just see this review app. And basically review app is like an ephemeral application that is very production-like, um, but is you know just lives there as long as the merge request lives. But you can actually see and interact with it. So QA and business people can see what this merge request is actually about to do. But that's that's great. But then we go further and say, all right, well since you've got this app there, let's um, let's run security tests on it. Let's actually try to do penetration tests on the application to see if what you just did introduced any security vulnerabilities. I mean, we also do static analysis of your code, but we'll do dynamic security tests on that review app and then give you the results right in the review app. So you don't have to wait for security to go and do their analysis. And you certainly don't have to wait until it's in production to find that there's actually a bug. You stop it before it gets into production. Mm. But then we go further and we'll run a performance test on it. And we'll, you know, at the simplest thing, we'll just hit the home page and measure how long it takes and analyze, you know, how long it takes to download and blah, blah, blah. Um, but we do like a speed analysis of that page. So again, the developer can see immediately if what they've just done is gonna slow down the application. Now we go further 
and say, all right, let's say I did deploy it to production and it did cause a problem. But again, the merge request is, is merged. So traditionally, you'd be like, all right, I'm done with it. That's an ops problem. But we don't. We go back and actually say, hey, we detected that memory usage went up in production and we um, you know, we associate it. We know that it was this merge request that was just deployed. So we'll let you know on the merge request that, hey, this is the impact on production. So you know, it was great that we did all these testing in, in the review app, but somehow it got past the review app. And now it's actually in production. But we still tie it all the way back. So that's, that's an example of deep integration, where this thing permeates so many different stages. And it's not just like, hey, we ran a test. It's we ran all these tests. We brought it back to the developer that made the change so that they are aware of what happened. All right, great. Um, OK, next question. I think this actually would be appropriate for both of you. Uh, most regulated industries, such as financial services and healthcare, mandate a separation of responsibilities that prevent dev from production access, and only ops have access to those environments. <clears throat> I'd appreciate your perspective on companies that have successfully bridged this construct. I, I don't mind taking that first. Um, so we had this very same problem at, um, at Microsoft when I was working on Office 365, and we had to develop you know, secure development and uh, operations practices to be FISMA compliant. And so the way we did this was we basically, um, first of all, in order for a developer to get you know, access to First, the developer did not have access to the production system. They would upload to a pre-production system, and then the operations person would actually uh, transition the pre-production system to the production box. The other thing that we had was the fact that um, in order to investigate, you couldn't do a live site. In order to do a live site investigation, we designated like um, the software engineering leads only could have access to it. So in this case, uh, the structure of the organization was, you know, every engineering lead had like say five or five to seven direct reports, those leads were responsible for sort of owning their team's you know, investigation, primary investigation. They would be the ones that held the pager and they would be the ones that would be the one that would have to go into a live site. But a live site investigation would be like the last, you know, the last thing that you'd wanna do. You don't wanna do it if it's at all possible. And instead what you do is you'd request, you know, log files from a certain period. The operations team would have a scrubber to eliminate PII or HIPAA data. And you would take that system and put it onto another system that was as close to identical as the, the system under test so you could investigate. And so the idea was there was a separation. Developers didn't push code directly to production. There was sort of like a firewall between the two. And that's how we uh, managed it for regulated industries. Um, and so that's how we did it for all, actually, just because it was like one process was easier to manage than multiple. Mark might have other things to add since I've been I've been out of development for about four years. So, uh, you know, that at least in that kind of capacity. No, that actually pretty much that was that was a great okay. example. Um, I think that's the same kind of stuff we're seeing. Um, there's definitely when it comes to compliance and things like that, people can take a really hard line and, um, you know, go into an extreme and say, oh, there needs to be you know, physical firewalls or, you know, no connection between these pieces. Or you can have you know a, a really good integrated approach that just has security baked in that you know we just enforce this via process and you know regulations and permissions and, and other kinds of pieces. So you know the technology can help there. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting line seeing where people uh, interpret how to do compliance. All right, great. Um, okay, so many questions to get through. Um, please know that if we don't get to your question during the event, um, Mark and Chris will actually get a copy of all the questions that come in. So um, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you post event. But let's uh, let's keep moving forward here. Um, next question, can monitoring be used as a pivot point to help create the culture of DevOps communication? That's a really good question. I do see monitoring as this sort of, um, you know, this tipping point. Like when you, like you said, you know, deploy to production, you know, CD, people have been talking about that for decades, really. Um, but once you start adding monitoring into your system, that's when you start to really feel like you've bridged, uh, you know, maybe a virtual wall, but, you know, a, a real impactful difference here of, of actually tapping into, okay, now I'm responsible for the operations of this. And that's when, when developers feel responsibility, you know, because they see it, um, you know, and there's lots of other ways too, right? They could, 
you can add in security and then they'll feel that part of it too. But, but once you've made that transition, you're like, oh, I'm responsible for the actual performance of this thing. You, you feel like that the walls are gone and now you're really working with, you know, whether the ops team is still separate or whether it's an SRE team that just helps, but whatever it is, it, it does sort of break down things. So I personally think that can be really good, but I'd love to hear if Chris has an yeah. answer. So what, one of the interesting things that happened uh, in my engineering days is we had a manager who decided he was going to do a, a monthly business review. And I thought, all right, that doesn't include me. But then lo and behold, it did include me. I was the engineering lead for a particular software component. And we had a he goes, I want you to tell me every metric that's going on with a live site. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, you know, I want to know how many 404s are there? How many 500 errors? How many, you know, exceptions are there in the log file? What's the average latency? You know, what's the average this? What's the average? He just wanted all these numbers. And I was like, what's he bugging me about? So we started collecting all this information. And this is back when, you know, it wasn't really automated. And every single month we'd get in front of this business review board and we'd report on these metrics. And, you know, it was really interesting. I was like, geez. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff going on in the live site that I didn't expect to be happening. And, and, and it was detrimental to the customer experience. And so the idea of monitoring and understanding what's going on with your product and not just sort of like, you know, I realized we were just throwing it over the wall. We were actually releasing it, going on to the next thing. And, you know, we'd let customer support manage what, you know, what was coming in and not really care about it. But the reality was we were putting out some, some code that was, you know, less than high quality. And once we started getting an idea that the fact that, you know, what we're writing is impacting our customers, you kind of get a lot more connected with them and you care a lot more about what their experience is. And when you can actually move the needle on some of those experiences and realize that there's no reason for people to have some of these crappy experiences, you can actually make an improvement. You can feel good about what you're doing and you can actually see a return on investment from the customers being happier and to you seeing, you know, less live site investigations. You can focus more on just getting stuff done and making improvements. So I think monitoring is a really important aspect of tying the developers to the product and letting them understand that you're delivering an experience to customers and, and that experience is very important. All right, great. Uh, next question, how much time does it take an average team to go from evolution SCM or CICD to the concurrent DevOps way of work? That's a great question, um, and it varies a lot. So averages are really hard. Um, you know, companies that have really deeply established DevOps or not DevOps, but development practices, and that are making this transition. Uh, you know, frankly, sometimes it can take them a year or two. You know, it usually becomes a, a top level initiative, and they plan out this thing, and it, and it takes them a really, really long to make that transformation. I've certainly seen it happen faster. Um, and I've certainly seen it happen slower. Uh, you know, people can talk about it for a long time and then not actually pull the trigger. But you know, with a concerted effort, it doesn't have to take that long. I think um, one thing that can help there is you know to to start with sort of one project, especially if you get like some new project. Start the new project in a new way, and you can start from scratch, and it's a lot easier. And then you can test things out, and then build up some experience and comfort, and then you've got these points you can talk to other people in your company about and be like, look, hey, this is a success. We can drag you over there. But, um, but you know, not every company can really do that. Um, Chris, do you have any other, do you have any hard numbers on that by any chance? No, I don't. You know, what I was going to say is that um, it's a struggle, right, for even folks to go from, um, you know, source code management and CI, CD to actually just accelerating it. What I'll see is, um, you know, some, some, it usually happens in legacy industries. It doesn't usually happen in like, you know, some of the newer companies. Uh, but, um, you know, they, they, die, they start a pilot and they start going down this whole DevOps approach, but then they find out that like, it's not working everywhere. And a lot of the times, um, you know, it comes to like uh, compliance and regulation where there are people sort of in the middle that feel like, you know, we need to follow a certain process or we're not really, you know, following the rules and regulations. And, I'm going to say it just comes down to culture. You need to sort of break down culture and get everybody on the same page to understand, here's the new way that we're going to operate. Here's the new way that we're going to integrate compliance and, and, and governance into this process so that it's integrated, as Mark was saying, not sort of like ancillary or bolt on. You want everything sort of integrated. You know, what I tell people that are in compliance that say, you know, I have to do 10 audits. I'm like, you shouldn't be doing 10 audits. 
What you should be doing is making sure that everybody that's along the value delivery chain is making sure all the check marks are being done. And you should just be, be making sure that they're following those rules and regulations and that they're providing you a report that says they did everything you told them to do. You're not, your job shouldn't be getting in the middle of all these processes and making sure that, you know, in interviewing all the developers or looking at their code. They're, they have responsibility to deliver those processes and deliver them in an efficient way. Uh, these other teams that are working with these uh, organizations need to help them not kind of get in the way. And so the problem is that people are responsible. They have their jobs to do. And they, and they don't want to get fired for not doing their job. And so unless the company sort of like starts from the top and says, here's a new way of operating. And oh, by the way, from the bottom up, we want to do innovation. We want you to be creative. Until those two pieces sort of come together, it's hard to break through any kind of culture gap. And so it really takes sponsorship from the top. And it takes sort of a willingness from the bottom, you know, the, the people, the worker bees, to want to be innovative and think about putting the customer first and think about ways they can break down these walls and, and move ahead. It kind of it takes new thinking and, and sponsorship of that new thinking to kind of make it all work. That, that's, that's been my experience and observation. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that whole culture aspect is, is, seems to be a sticking point for so many companies. Um, quick time check. We're about four minutes to the top of the hour. I think we can get through one or two more questions. Um, actually, the whole culture idea is a perfect seg into this next question, which is how and what steps do we take to initiate the culture transformation and also cha change team culture? Yeah, so I don't mind taking that one. Uh, I think it starts with that whole value stream approach where you look at all the steps it takes to get product out the door. And then, you know, capturing metrics. It's almost the same question about when you monitor something and you realize that the process that you're currently using or the software you're releasing has all these bugs in it, you want to make it better. And when you monitor the process and you actually put like, you know, a voltage meter on every single connection in your whole entire tool chain and you realize there's so much time lost, there's so much, you know, effort being wasted on meetings and whatnot. And Mark also talked about, you know, big a agile versus little a agile. You know, stop following dogma, stop following religion and think about what's going to work best for you. How do you break down these walls and silos and get things working together and getting them, getting them to work better? And nothing helps more than just having facts put in front of you. How long does it take to get something from point A to point B? What's holding us up? What do we got to do to make it better? Okay, great. Um, next question is for Mark. Uh, how do we get users trained as a GitLab administrator prior to adoption of the commercial product? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I guess there's a lot of ways you can you can do that. I, I mean, there's a you know, we have the the free um, community edition, uh, what we're calling Libra now. Um, you know, you can download that and try it out, and try it out on a small project. Um, it won't have all the functionality for your large teams, but to get started and to get the administrator playing with that, it definitely works. Um, also, of course, we have the .com offering. I mean, you don't even need to install anything uh, to, to start to play with projects and set up your CSV pipelines and all that kind of thing. I mean, we even provide free shared runners for your CI CD. Um, so up to a certain point, you can do a lot of things for free on .com. Who could ask for anything more, Mark? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, a, you know, it's a pretty sweet deal, if you ask me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we, I mean, we're obviously built on open source. We're an open core company. And so we really give back to the community a lot. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can start to make this really easy. Um, but, you know, of course, it depends on you know, what your what your concerns really are. Uh, you know, if you want to talk to a salesperson, you can certainly arrange with us and we'll have somebody help you through it. Um, but it's really, really easy just to get started on your own. All right. Great. Well, we are... One minute to the top of the hour, so we're going to have to close out the questions now. But uh, um, uh, thank you to everybody who did submit a question. And as I said earlier, if we didn't get to your question, um, I'm sure these guys will be more than happy to follow up with you post-event. So um, don't, uh, don't feel like your question is just hanging out there and is going to be completely ignored. Um, so uh, Chris Kondo and Mark Punsack, thank you both for joining me. Um, I, I, I know the audience got a lot out of it, and I certainly got a lot out of it. 
And I also want to remind the audience that if you uh, missed any or all of today's webinar, it is being recorded. So um, you will receive a link post event that will take you to the webinar on demand. You can also uh, find the webinar on the devops.com website. We also have a listing of other webinars on the website. So uh, take a look, see if anything piques your interest. Um, Chris, Mark, thanks again for joining me. I appreciate, appreciate your time. It was a great uh, presentation. Thank you, Shalini. Uh, thank you, and I hope everybody has a great day.